What's up everybody, it's Mansant back at you with a really off the wall Leviah build today that was good enough to take me to six and one at this 18 person uh, win a box event I attended today uh, where I got a box of Crucible for getting first and won this lovely mat. Uh, the deck performed amazing and I hadn't even gone into this tournament with any testing, uh, but it was really cool and I have some uh, suggestions for how to make it even better. So uh, let's get into it. So the first thing to note about this build is that it is a romping club only build. And this is really unique to this Leviah deck because normally you see the weapons in Leviah builds revolve around dealing the most amount of damage uh, in tune with her blood debt playstyle. So Mandible Claws uh, normally works very well in the more aggressive list because it gets the most damage out of Blood Rush. Hexagore gets the most value in these late game Blood Debt decks because it just lets you sink two resources for six, which is extremely efficient. But tanking Romping Club allows you to have an early game weapon that is just a consistent breakpoint that will bleed damage throughout the entire game. So Romping Club actually opens up the early game to be quite strong for Leviah into the late game where all of a sudden a four power attack can still demand two cards when the game is really tight. So as you see, as I show you the rest of the deck, this weapon is very integral to how you want to play the deck, whether you take it the more aggressive route or the more defensive route. Um, so then we'll take a look at the equipment here. And for the headpiece, it's always going to be Arknight Skullcap, unless you're versus Wizard or versus Briar. Uh, you, um, and when you're versus those two heroes, I would switch to the Skullhorn. And that's because, of course, Skullhorn uh, versus Wizard is great for the Arcane Barrier too, just to soak as much Arcane damage as possible. But then versus Briar, you can use the Arcane Barrier too to soak up uh, either their replacement effects with like Sting of Sorcery and Ball Lightnings when the game's really tight, or on the Rosettas to soak two damage. And when you soak two damage, you can actually break Spellbound Creepers when they really wanted to stick around, um, even on that first turn they use it. So Skullhorn, pretty nifty in that matchup. Then we've got the arm pieces here. And the arm pieces, uh, you got the most choices here. And of course you take the Null Rune Gloves uh, when you're versus the Rune Blades or when you're versus Wizard. Then you've got the Goliath Gauntlet and the Gamblers. And the Goliath you're gonna take versus a lot of the um, aggro matchups that don't have any arcane damage or the matchups where um, you're probably not gonna be in the driver's seat and wanna play more defensive. Um, you'll take Gambler's Gloves when you uh, know that you're gonna be more of the aggressor and need to be making more proactive gameplay decisions to advance the game to a winnable state. So that would be your really, really control matchups, probably like Bravo and uh, Old Him. Um, perhaps even control dash, you're really going to have to take gamblers to make sure you're pushing damage that matters. Um, then we've got the tunic. Tunic is absolutely the key to making this de deck work to the point where you don't even take carrion husk. I don't think carrion husk would work with how this deck aims to play. The tunic resource is so strong, especially with how slow and drawn out this Leviah build wants to take the game. So you take that in every matchup. And then of course you also take scabskins in every matchup. Um, namely the block two, then block one is fantastic. But uh, even the um, rolling of the D6 can come into your favor. Um, normally you don't want to do that too often because you're not taking gamblers gloves in that many matchups but you know it's there so uh let's check out the main deck all right everybody and as we look at the core of the deck here we can already see that this is very different to how we normally see levi decks built and that is namely because we're only running these nine blood deck cards the endless maw the dread screamer and the writhing beast hulk and that's pretty much it in the core of the deck here now this kind of deck like i had mentioned before when talking about the equipment is really built around using the Findel Spring Tunic and the Romping Club to play for maximum efficiency as the game goes on. You're wanting to gain value out of your weapon pretty much every turn you can. Um, choosing to swing weapon instead of swinging an attack for most of the game. And then with your Tunic, when you get that third counter, it unlocks a whole variety of plays for your deck. One of the easiest things to do when you're playing this kind of slower build is set yourself up for a very strong second cycle where you use the tunic trigger plus a red to actually swing club for four still. And that lets you really easily set up um, the bottom of your deck to have really strong cards, even though you're blocking with three cards as the game goes on. Now, this kind of slower strategy is great for the brute archetype as a whole. And that's namely because of this card barraging beatdown on the right here. Barraging Beatdown is the kind of card that is really good across all matchups because 
Against aggro decks, if you're able to barraging beat down even just your weapon, they are likely not going to block and you gain a ton of value on the buff that this provided. Against control decks, you can try to set up multiple barraging beatdowns in a turn to really push through a ton of damage. And to help that strategy of pushing through intimidates to deal a ton of damage, we're also running the smash instincts here to do the same. It's just that added layer of intimidates that can really push through a lot of this damage. Um, but you know, by no means are any of these cards to be played before they're really to be considered for blocking because this deck is going to block quite a bit as you grind the game down and start to chip in value just because of how efficient uh, your cards are. And as you get into second cycle and you actually start to play some of your big powerhouse cards like the Dread Screamers, like the Endless Maws, like the Writhing Beast Hulks with all the barraging beatdown uh, stacks on it, you just start to have this incredible deck that no one saw coming in the second cycle here, which I think is very Leviathan thematic. So if we look at the rest of the cards that are here, it's some pretty stock standard stuff. We have, of course, the combo of Blood Rush Bellows and Beast Within. That's because if you have a Dread Screamer set up in Arsenal and you can draw into this combo, uh, it is always just really strong to play, but by no means do you have to actually uh, set up the Dread Screamer Blood Rush Bellow. One of the beautiful things about running the Tunic Romping Club plan is that if you keep only two cards in hand, perhaps the Blood Rush is an Arsenal, you use the Tunic to pay for the Blood Rush, and then with that other card, whether it was in hand or what, uh, is going to be a six. You discard it, you get to draw two cards. One of those cards will be pitched for Romping Club. The other card you can then set up in your Arsenal. So all of a sudden off two cards, you swung for seven and reset your arsenal. So that alone is a really good play, strong enough reason to run the Blood Rush there. Um, so the Beast Within, not necessarily too integral to uh, playing it alongside Blood Rush, but of course it's there, it's great, it's a six, blocks three, it's yellow, so you can swing Romney Club. So might as well run it. Um, then we've got the Wrecker Rops. You're gonna run that in every Brute deck for the time being, I would think. And then we've got your additional ways to turn off Blood Debt in the Convulsions and the Unworldly Bellow. And these are really in the deck because there are really awkward moments in the game where perhaps you've gone too hard on the Blood Debt uh, before you are in a winning position. And if you've done that, you need a bailout. You need more ways to actually turn off your Blood Debt. So that's why these cards are in here. Um, as you play this deck, you'll realize that your graveyard is going to be a good 30 cards or so deep before you're actually ideally ever trying to start playing towards blood debt. But once you do and you're getting frantic about uh, being able to turn it off each turn, these cards are just that extra insurance because they don't cost your action point to swing with your attack, perhaps uh, if your attack is another one of these. Um, as well. So then we've got uh, the Pummels here. Pummels is another fantastic play when you've got a blue pitch. The blue pitch is going to leave one floating. You'll have your tunic up, like I mentioned, and then you can swing Romping Club. With that one floating, you can use the tunic, pummel it, and all of a sudden squeeze through seven. And we're running the yellows here because we want this play to come up later when your opponent is really trying to be greedy with their hands to close out this game, but you can just do it better than they can. And that's when your pummels come back, you pitch them through because they're yellow, and you get those cheeky plays off, and you're now going over the top and putting them on the back foot before they were expecting it. Um, of course, this also combos, combos fantastically with Command & Conquer, because Command & Conquer, you can pitch a blue four, you'll have the one floating, and then with Tunic, you can pummel it off of three cards, which is absolutely backbreaking for a lot of aggro decks. It's really good against the Rangers as well. Um, really good against just most decks, honestly. Great, great combo there. No reason not to have it. Uh, and then the last thing to talk about on the screen here is going to be your one ofs. That is the Eye of Ophidia, because uh, it combos with some of the package cards I'll be showing. The Soul Harvest, because it's just an extra blue six. And then one Reckless Swing for that late game insurance. So I hope that made some sense here. It's been a long day of flesh and blood. Uh, but let's go into the packages and what they change about the deck. All right, so as we look at the different packages here of defense, offense, and then some different options that I think you'd like to toy with, um, the main thing to note is that you're going to be taking these packages in either in a mix or completely dedicated to one play style or another. Um, but pretty much what I did for the tournament today was take the defensive package here when I was committed to either playing a very keen, precise second cycle setup 
where I want to use the sync blows and fate for scenes to deliberately put really strong cards uh, together in strong hands for that second cycle of the deck. Um, or if I wanted to take the game to a true fatigue route versus something like a zero cost Briar or Lexi, where I'm gonna, going to just count down their resources, always check their graveyard and draw them out of the ability to ever have threat over me. Um, and if that's the route I'm going for, man, this package was super strong. So some things to note, um, Favor scenes, sink below's obviously fantastic, but then the two more flex slots on the defense reactions here were really, really strong. So the other tool that you get by playing um, a shadow hero is access to Guardian of the Shadow Realm. And Guardian of the Shadow Realm was a standout card today. I was really debating running the unmovables instead, but one of the great parts about the Guardian of the Shadow Realm is that you can do that same thing offensively as defense uh, when you have those reds in hand, where you can use Tunic uh, plus one red in hand to play the Guardian. And that is really, really strong for your ability to still set up these really strong red hands when you had to block with the rest of your hand. Um, so that was fantastic, of course. And of course, it also has the ability for when you pitch a blue, uh, you're able to use that last resource, soak to your Null Rune if it's that kind of matchup, and still play the Guardian. So really, really strong card there. I never actually got the Recursion piece to uh, work with Guardian because I was never playing it early enough to be able to banish it and add it back to hand. But there are a couple times where that could have been the play uh, with something like Deadwood, drawing, banishing, deliberately targeting Guardian, and then getting that back to hand, but never, never actually came up. Um, and then the last card of the Defense Reaction Package is the Springboard Somersault. And this card is really, really fantastic for how Brute plays. And that's because in the second, or in that uh, first cycle of your deck, when you see the springboards, you're going to prioritize just going ahead and pitching this card. Um, or if you ha have the opportunity, of course, you want to arsenal it, but don't be too greedy about it. But in that second cycle is when Springboard's really strong because you know that both of them are coming back. So you get to arsenal that first one and then just keep it there because you're normally low on defense reactions for that second cycle. And then very specifically when you either are forced to play it or see your second Springboard, then you're free to go ahead, play that first Springboard out, reset it, and now you know that you never have to think about in the back of your head clearing your arsenal for when you see your springboards. Because in the beginning of the game, you don't necessarily want to clear your arsenal um, if you don't have to, because there's some really good pieces that you want to leave there. So springboard, really, really fantastic card. Um, so that's the defense package. Uh, then we've got the aggro package for when you're in more of the driver's seat. And that is the shadow puppetries, another amazing card in the shadow package, um, which gives your card plus one go again. And if it hits, of course, look at the top and you may banish. This card is fantastic in conjunction with Command and Conquer, of course. Um, it lets you come in with Command and Conquer for seven, which is an amazing breakpoint. If you pitch a blue and then use that tunic like I've been talking about, you then get to follow up your attack, probably with the Romping Club, because the one floating on the blue and then the tunic is going to let you come in, and now you've swung 11 with a really strong hit effect uh, for only three cards. Really strong. Shadow Puppetry also combos really well with any of your two-cost hitters uh, for that same tunic combo, whether it be like Pulping, if you're not sure, on the draw discard effect, or something like Writhing Beast Talk, whatever it is. So Shadow Puppetry, very, very strong card throughout the day today. Pulping, Really, honestly, really good as well. I think this card overperformed um, because it really pushes a lot of damage alongside the cards like Barrage and Beatdown. It can act like another version of Writhing Beast Hulk um, with that Dominate, with the ability to just push through lots and lots of damage with the Gogan. It's also going to buff the Romping Club up to five because of the discard text. So all of a sudden, potentially off of two cards, the pulping in a blue uh, and the tunic resource, you've now swung for 11. Two cards for 11, really, really strong. So great card there. Then we've got the rest of now the blood debt aggro package, and that's the red deadwoods, and then just adding some more blues to help you have these more fluid hands um, with the blue deadwoods as well. As well, Red deadwoods, of course, fantastic when um, you just have those two card hands to swing eight. Also really good in the early game because you can go ahead and start trimming misses from your graveyard for later, or like I mentioned, potentially get that guardian out. So um, these were all, all really good cards. Everything worked, everything in the core of what I showed you, everything in these sideboard here. But then the stuff that didn't work, um, namely the 
of Reckless Swing and the Doomsday I had in the sideboard as a plan for uh, basically ice decks. I, I wanted more blues to potentially break through the frostbites, whatever, whatever. And I really thought that uh, there's the potential here for in the control decks, if I take Doomsday and I play it really slow, I could use my Soul Harvest offensively and actually clear out enough blood deck cards where Doomsday would be live and I'd be able to summon Blasmfet. And that never actually worked out. And on top of that, summoning Blasmfet is really not that strong in this deck because you don't have enough go again to swing it every turn. Uh, and if you take up your blood debt to six, you're not going to be consistently turning it off enough where it was actually worth it. So Doomsday, definitely on the cutting, the chopping block here, did not think it was strong enough. And then the second Reckless Swing also was just really not strong enough. Uh, with how slow this deck was playing and uh, how grindy the games got, that one Reckless Swing, swing was definitely enough. Uh, you didn't need to kind of advance them taking two damage really at any point in the game. So the second Reckless, just not good enough. I do think... Um, if you're planning for maybe dash in your meta, these two slots could go to Arc Smash and that'd be really strong because I don't think this deck can really beat dash uh, anyway with what it's trying to do. So that is the defense, the offense. All right, and then for how my matchups went and which packages I went today, in round one, I played against Lightning Briar, um, one of my good friends here in the Michigan area. Uh, and I wasn't actually sure if he was on Lightning or Earth Briar. Uh, I hedged my bets for Lightning, where I do think you have a better chance of actually fatiguing the deck. And so I took the defense reaction route along with the Null Rune Gloves and the Skullhorn and successfully fatigued him out. Uh, and was able to close the game from a combination of really strong barraging turns, uh, you know, refilling Arsenal with the Blood Rush, and just having a really fluid game overall. Everything worked to my advantage, but I only put in, I believe, the Defense Reaction Package, and I did add the Blue Deadwoods because I wanted a bit more blues because I knew I'd be pitching in um, quite a bit to the Null Run pieces. And then uh, round two, I played against um, a Prism who, who could go both ways, Flex, Auras, or Heralds. Of course, they chose to go Auras, and um, because of that, I went the more aggressive package um, and just kind of blew out that matchup. It was no sweat. When you're playing Prism with any kind of Leviathan build, you're normally pretty favored. Um, however, this build is even more so favored because you're not racking up blood debt when you have your turns to just uh, blow up an aura and play it a bit slower. So game went really well. I did beat the Prism. Uh, and then round three, I was against a Lexi, and this is a player who normally plays a lot of Ice Lexi, so I was expecting Ice Lexi, so I took all of the aggro package in along with the extra blues to break the frostbites. Um, and I actually tossed in the guardians as well, because um, when you get a frostbite from their reveal and you pitch a blue to break it on their turn with the guardian, that can open you up to have better hands uh, on the offense. So took all that and uh, turns out he was on lightning Lexi. So made the complete wrong call, but I still won just by outpacing him damage wise to kind of took the game a bit slower. Um, didn't take it quite to true fatigue, um, but by that second cycle, my deck just had better hands than him and uh, just won that game. Uh, so then we've got the next round he here, which was uh, round four. And round four, I played against Bravo, and uh, I wasn't quite sure how this deck would handle Bravo by going more aggressive or more defensive, because obviously you think in a second cycle type scenario, Bravo is always going to be stronger. So I decided to go full aggro with this package, and it didn't quite work. Uh, because you're still just a deck with raw numbers. And so if Bravo has the hand where he's just keen on keeping it because his hands are going to equal hit effects that can just lose you the game, um, he's going to do that. So we played through that game and that's exactly what happened. Uh, he just kept the better hands that just had better hit effects. I mean, we're talking like Righteous and obviously Spinal Crush um, and uh, yeah. So that game, or Crippling Crush rather, that game did lose, uh, but it was pretty close. So I figured maybe if I just throw everything in next time, it'll work out. So um, then because there were 18 players, we did a cut to top eight. Top eight, I played against a Dorinthia. And of course, versus Dorinthia, all these are going to go in. I added the extra Reckless Swing as well. Uh, we played through it, took that to True Fatigue, and was hoping that he wasn't keen on the fact I'd try to do that. But he was running Triple Remembrance and was able to shuffle in 
quite a few amount of Warriors Valors and Nourishings, um, but I still close out that game because they do just run out of the attack reactions and with all the shuffling that Remembrance does, they're not actually crafting really strong hands. So I won that game super handily. He never even got a can counter on Dawnblade, but it was a really fun game because it wasn't the traditional, I'm gonna overblock by three every turn because I had so many defense reactions I could play a lot more uh, forcefully making him commit and then I will commit. It's a really, really fun game. Uh, then I had top four where I played against a different Bravo player. Um, he was a fan of the channel, so shout out to Tarek. Uh, we played this match, another really fun one. I set up the deck to have a really strong second cycle um, with a lot of dominate effects, and that's exactly what happened. Um, I, I took in both packages, so we've got the defense and the offense, uh, even through in the Doomsday as well, and by taking it to this very carefully crafted second cycle, and then even a third cycle beyond that, uh, even though our health totals, totals were tight, I had protected so much health with my defense reactions, and yet pushed enough aggression with the aggro package, and still set up really strong endgame effects with the barraging beatdowns, the writhing beast hulks, and the convulsions the bells of hell, I was able to win that game. Um, and I, I think I, I would in a rematch as well. This deck just seemed to do it better than Bravo could in those end states because I can trade off fewer cards to deal more damage than he can um, when he just trades, you know, blocks two, can swing a Nothos for six. If I block two, keep two cards, my turns can be up to 10 because I've got this the Tunic uh, and Romping Club that always open up when I have a six cost and a blue. So really, really fun match there. Took me into the finals versus um, the Lexi player again. This time I knew he was Lightning Lexi, so I ditched the aggro package, took in just the defensive package and decided to take it to Fatigue, um, which I did, but he had this amazing turn with Red Electrify um, with three attacks, ended with a Command and Conquer at the end of the attack chain, and I was stuck with a defense reaction uh, and then another card uh, so I couldn't block out the Command and Conquer and uh, took a whopping amount of damage from that turn and thought I'd probably lost it, but was able to claw it back, took him to True Fatigue where he had only two cards left in his deck, and of course I have a weapon and he doesn't, uh, and was able to win the game from there. So really, really great performance by the deck. Um, I'd played Reinar a bit before, but I actually think the power of Romping Club and Tunic is more exemplified in the Levia deck than even Reinar, and that's because you have the extra go again options with Shadow Puppetry. Um, you've got the extra defense reactions with the Guardian of the Shadow Realm, and then you have that incredible second cycle you can build towards that's not very card hungry in the Endless Maw, Writhing Beast Hulk, and the Dread Screamer. So fantastic deck, was really impressed by its performance and hope that you all enjoy it and uh, probably change these cards for uh, something better. And with that, this was Mansant. Have a good one.